Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist at EarningsBeats.com and this is Trading Places Live. It's Monday, May 25th, 2020, and I am pre-recording this Trading Places Live for Tuesday morning, May 26th. Futures are solidly higher, but I'll be watching to see if that positive action continues overnight. Um, before I get into the action, um, well, let's go ahead and go through the agenda. Uh, I will go through and show you what happened on Friday. Had a pretty solid uh, you know, week last week. Market continues trying to march higher. We'll take a look at some key resistance levels. Uh, I'm gonna get into talking technically and really, I think one of the most important charts to keep in mind is the long-term 100-year chart. That is kind of what I use to guide me from a longer-term perspective, and that's why I've stuck to my, my belief that we're in a secular bull market. So I went throughout the entire fourth quarter of 2018 and throughout 2019 when we had all the trade war issues and the Fed was trying to figure out what the heck to do. They kept getting it wrong. Throughout that entire period, we had a lot of volatility. We had fear but I stood by my longer term secular bull market theme. And uh, I did the same thing here through the pandemic the last couple of months and uh, wasn't a very popular decision. I think a lot of folks believed and maybe still do that we're in a longer term bear market. I do not believe that. But uh, I think this chart is worth saving and uh, continuing to monitor as we go into the days, weeks and months ahead. Uh, then we're going to get into uh, June seasonality. So I've got a few things I just want to mention uh, about June and uh, historically what the S&P 500 does and uh, what, the, what some of the sectors, key areas of the market do. So we'll talk a little bit about June seasonality. Got a lot of uh, earnings still coming up this week. And I want to go through maybe the top 12, 15, pull up the charts uh, and just give you my opinion on what we might see when those earnings reports come out. And then we're gonna wrap up the show with uh, the three you must see. These are three charts that I think are worth taking a look at before we get into the action uh, when we open on Tuesday. Um, all right, let's take a look at, uh, before I get into any of those things, I just wanna show you over at Earnings Beats. Um, we do have a free Earnings Beats Digest newsletter. I publish it Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. It's uh, generally a pretty quick read. I mean, probably it'll take you no more than uh, I don't know, maybe two, three minutes, uh, three days a week. And it's usually packed with educational ideas, trading ideas. Um, I look at uh, earnings. I look at relative strength. I look at accumulation distribution, which has been a great indicator throughout much of this pandemic. And uh, I think it's uh, certainly be worth your time. So if you haven't already subscribed, go over to earningsbeats.com. Right here on the home page, you can see there's a uh, little blue area here, subscribe to the free Earnings Beats Digest newsletter. All it takes is a name and an email address. Hit that subscribe button and starting on Wednesday, you will receive the uh, article that I publish. And they usually, the articles normally come out sometime around 8.30ish uh, in the morning. So normally before you uh, start your market day. All right, let's jump into the action from uh, Friday. And you can see, uh, it was a little bit of a mixed day. We had the Dow Jones down nine points. The S&P was up seven. NASDAQ up 40. So NASDAQ was doing pretty well on a relative basis. Mid caps relatively flat up a point, And then small caps did a little bit better, up about four points or roughly about one half of 1%. Looking at the sectors, you can see real estate a leader, uh, utilities leading. These were really the two big groups. Real estate up over 2%. Utilities more than 1%. And then we had communication services, three-fifths of 1%, technology, about uh, one-third of 1%. Same goes with staples. But overall, pretty good action in the market, not just on Friday, but last week. I thought the market held up pretty well. You can see, uh, looking at the mid-caps, right at that late April high, trying to break out. That would be very bullish. The S&P 500 has struggled here just a little bit right under 20, or excuse me, right under 3,000. Closed it on Friday at 29.55. Breakout above 3,000 would be very bullish for a couple of reasons. We do have some overhead gap resistance. I believe it's at 29.72. We got the 50 day moving average, um, which is, uh, or excuse me, 50 week, 50 week moving average, which is at about uh, 29.98. So those are going to be two levels, key levels that will be taken out if we close over 3,000. So that's something to watch for this week. 10-year uh, treasury yield. 
Uh, looking ahead to uh, economic reports on Tuesday, the big one I'll be watching is the April new home sales. That'll be out at 10 a.m. The expectation is for 495,000 units. March was 627,000. So you know, clearly the uh, market is expecting a much lower report. Home building stocks, home construction really got hit hard though throughout the pandemic. And uh, the group is starting to bounce back pretty nicely, which I think bodes well for uh, our economy. I think the market's looking down the road and kind of likes what it's seeing as far as our reaction, our rebound from this pandemic. Uh, and you really can't question interest rates. I mean, looking here at the 10-year treasury yield, and the 10-year treasury yield is kind of a barometer of uh, the uh, mortgage rates. And so when you see the 10-year treasury yield not really moving back to the upside and staying very low, that's telling us that mortgage rates are going to remain low, or at least are remaining low. And that should help home construction stocks as well. The 10-year treasury yield finished last week at 0.66%. We've been you know, I would, I would kind of define this right now as a trendless market um, in the 10-year treasury. Yield. Clearly, we were going lower, but I would say over the last four weeks or so, it's been mostly sideways. When I see movement above key moving averages, especially that 20-day moving average, if it's a trend back to the upside, normally when we come back down and hit the 20-day, we'll bounce and go higher. In this case, you can see we've had multiple moves through the 20 to the upside and then back down below the 20 back through the 20, back down below the 20. And then just last week, a big move, not only through the 20, but also the first time since the first week of January that we've been above the 50 on 50 day on the 10 year treasury yield. And then right back down below, not only the 50, but right back below the 20 again. So I think this is just telling us really that we're just in a period of consolidation and there really is no trend in the 10 year treasury yield. And if earnings can grow and the economy can pick back up with low interest rates, historically low interest rates, I think that's a very bullish development, not just for home builders, but for U.S. equities in general. All right, let's keep moving on. I wanted to go through and uh, show you in talking technically the long-term S&P 500 chart. So here you can see this is a 100-year chart. So we go all the way back to the mid-1920s. Uh, uh, all the way to 2020. And the key is, and I've gone over this plenty of times, but if you're new to the show, I'll just take a second to go through it. If you see, there's uh, multiple times these red shaded areas are areas where the stock market over a long period of time, one, two decades, uh, goes nowhere. So we hit a high here in 1937, and we didn't break above that high until 1950. That's 13 years. You go here and you set a high in 1968. We went just uh, just slightly above in 1972. Uh, but really, we didn't make a definitive breakout for about 13 years. Same as back you know, from 37 to 50. That was also 13 years. If you look at the top that we hit in 2000, um, we didn't break above that 2000 high and 2007 high until 2013. Once again, 13 years. So you got these, all three of these periods are 13 years of what I refer to as a secular bear market. And that is a longer term bear market where you just basically go nowhere for a very long period of time. But when you come out of these periods, you tend to go up very rapidly. Not to say that you don't have cyclical bear markets where with char short term bear markets, because if you look back in the 1950s and 60s, we had a very nice secular bull market but we had four different periods of significant short, fairly short-term pullbacks. And if you look back in 1982, when we made, you know, really started to move in the 80s and 90s, um, we had some pullbacks back then. We had the recession in 90, 90 into 91. We also had the 1987 stock market crash. And I believe when history is all said and done, the period that we're in right now, I think is going to be looked back upon very similarly to the 1987 stock market crash, where we went down in a month and then kept going back up, never had a double bottom, never retested those lows. Um, anybody who's still waiting for a retest of 1987 crash is still waiting. Um, and now that we're at 2,900 on the S&P, I don't think we're going back to 200. So it's, you know, we're never going to go back and retest that. I think there's a very good chance we never go back and retest this low that we saw in, uh, in March. 
down under 2,200. And I know there's a lot that would disagree with me and that's fine. I think what happened is that the stock market goes in cycles. And I think we went through this cycle of 12, 13 years. Our GDP was growing, not every year, but we certainly grew over these 13 years. We had inflation, yet the stock market didn't go anywhere. And so I think once you go through a period like this, the market tends to be very bullish and makes up for lost ground until we get to a point where we've just gone too far. Um, seven years from 2013 to 2020, that's typically not too far. This was 1950 to 1969, talking about almost two decades, 1982 to 2000, almost two decades. I would be looking for this to extend probably until about the year 2030 or into the 2030s before I would be looking for a more definitive longer term top and perhaps a secular bear market. So I don't think we're uh, going back down. I think the market continues to go higher. And this is my big picture chart that I like to use as confirmation for what I'm looking for. And I think it served me well. That was the end of 2018 where we had the drop back tested that 50 week moving average. This drop, like I said, much more like 1987, very, very significant move down. Uh, but we've rallied right back up off of it. And I think we're going to end up later this year or into 2021, I fully suspect that we're going to be at an all-time high and continuing to push higher. All right, uh, let's move on. How about June seasonality? Um, all right, I want to go through a few of these charts with you. Um, first, on the XLV, um, and I'll show you how you can do this on stock charts. So if you go in here to uh, just scroll down to seasonality, and then you pull up the XLV. You can do this with any index, with any ETF, um, any individual stock, whatever you want to check out. Now, when you pull this up in, in the seasonality box here, it'll show you how each or how that particular security, in this case, the ETF, the XLV, which tracks healthcare, it'll show how it's performed within each month, calendar month, over the last five years. Five years is the default. Now, when I'm looking at history, I don't want to look at, you know, we could say, well, you know, last year, April was a huge year. So that means April is going to be, well, you know, one year. It's not really giving us much information. But I think the further you can drag this back, so I always like to go to the max, which is 20 years, and then take a look at, you know, what's been, you know, going on in terms of not just the, um, the asset that you're looking at, you know, that whether it's an ETF, the individual stock, index, whatever. Um, I like to compare it to a benchmark. And I'm always comparing my own performance and everything we do at Earnings Beats. We compare it to the benchmark S&P 500. Because honestly, if we can't beat the S&P 500, if, if everything we do doesn't result in beating the S&P 500, then we should just put our money in the SPY and forget about it. Go, you know, golfing and playing tennis, hiking in the mountains, go to the beach. Um, you know, now that some of the the uh, stay-at-home orders are being lifted. We're allowed to do some of those things now. Um, but again, if you can't beat the benchmark, then why are we doing any of this? Just put your money in the benchmark and go do something else. So the XLV, you know, when I look at the, the historical information, I want to know how the XLV is performing relative to the benchmark. So you might look down here and say, well, June, that's not very good over the last 20 years, only three-tenths of 1% average. But when you compare it to the S&P 500, you're going to see a different story. And so if I drag this back 20 years, now look at June for the XLV. Not only is it outperforming the S&P 500 by more than one full percentage point, which is only matched by one other month, which is January. So if you look across here at the bottom, this is the average um, outperformance or underperformance of whatever you're looking at relative to whatever else you're looking at. So in this case, healthcare versus the S&P 500, January and June have averaged outperforming more than any other month. So that's good to know going into June that healthcare has, has performed really well. The other thing I think is interesting is, are these numbers at the top of these bars. And what that's telling us is how many, you know, what's the percentage of Junes that the XLV has outperformed the S&P 500? 79%. So 79% of Junes over the last 20 years, we've seen outperformance by healthcare. 
and the average outperformance has been 1.1%. That's good to know going into June. Now, I'm not saying that you just rush out and you buy the XLV and you know get a second mortgage and put it. I mean, that, that's not what I'm saying here at all. What we're looking for are tendencies. What we're looking for is to, um, to do our research to put us in a better position to outperform. And I think that's knowledge worth having. Now, again, that doesn't mean I'm going to jump right in and buy XLV first thing on June 1st or at the close on May 31st. But it is nice to know that healthcare has that tendency. Um, it's going to add to anything I see on an XLV chart or maybe some individual healthcare stocks. You know, there might be some stocks that I really like and I happen to look those up and see that, hey, they perform really well historically in the month of June. Well, that adds to that bullish argument. Okay, um, so that's the XLV. Now, what isn't working in June? Well, the XLK technology. Let's check this out. So if I drag this back for the last 20 years, you will see that June, now look at the difference between what we just looked at with healthcare and what we're looking at now with technology. Technology has only beaten the S&P 500 26% of Junes over the last 20 years. So you might think, well, if, you know, whatever happens in one sector is going to happen in another sector in a particular month. I mean, why would one sector do better than another sector? I don't have the answer for you, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense that XLV would be up 79% of the time in June and XLK would only be up 26% of the time. And the XLV outperformed on average 1.1% in the month of June. And when we look at technology, it underperforms by an average of 0.4%. So if everything else is equal going into the month of June, I'm going to prefer healthcare over technology simply because of the seasonality. So I think it's a good idea to at least know going into a month what areas of the market uh, may outperform simply based on history. Now, one other solid area of the market that you might want to be aware of is utilities. Utilities tend to do well in the month of uh, June. And you can see 63% of the time utilities outperform the S&P. And look at that outperformance, 1.2%. The only other month that uh, has that kind of performance is August, which outperforms by 1.2% as well uh, and goes up 68% of the time relative to the S&P 500. So utilities, another area of the market. You know, if you're a little nervous about the market and Let's say we get up you know, close to that 3,000 level and the S&P can't get through, maybe have some negative divergences. Utilities might be a little bit of a hedge, something to at least be aware of as we go into the month. Um, I know uh, also a lot of folks talk about the go away in May. I'm not a fan of that at all. I've done a lot of historical research. I think if you're going to go away in the market, you go away in about mid-July and come back at the end of September. That is when the market historically has had some issues. May and June are not that bad. In fact, the uh, May 26th, which is Tuesday, May 26th through June 6th, so we're talking about an 11-day period in the market, the S&P 500 has produced annualized returns over that 11-day period of 28.99%, going back to 1950. So that's 70 years worth of data, 11 days per year, and it has an annualized return of 28.99%. So I think that is definitely worth uh, keeping in mind and knowing as you go in. And, and that's typical of most calendar months at the end of the month and then into the beginning of the next month. The 26th to about the 5th or the 6th tends to be a pretty bullish period just about every month. So it's something to, uh, to be aware of. All right, two more things I wanted to mention here in uh, seasonality talked about the fact that technology underperforms. So I thought I would just show you semiconductors um, and semiconductors relative to the S&P 500 in the month of June. So it under, well, it outperforms the S&P only 37% of the time in June. And look at the average underperformance, minus 1.7%. The only month worse is September. So Semiconductors are an area that you might want to be a little careful of, just knowing historically, if you see things technically on the charts, 
that maybe look a little toppy. Maybe we have a false breakout, negative divergence, reversal, shooting star, you know, that kind of thing, or bearish engulfing candle. Keep this historical information in the back of your mind. Then the other uh, technology area I wanted to mention also is computer hardware. So think Apple. Um, but computer hardware over the last 20 years, up only 32% of the time relative to the S&P 500. So 68% of the Junes, it's underperformed. And you can see, again, the average uh, underperformance is by 0.9%. And when you look across, that is the worst month except for December. So June is not a great month for technology, especially semiconductors and computer hardware. So keep all of that in mind. All right, let's keep moving on. Let's look at uh, earnings spotlight. And I thought what I would do is just go through a number of earnings reports and just give you a sense of you know, what I'm thinking. I'm gonna pull this up in relative chart form. And I'll go through these pretty quickly with you. Um, AZO, it definitely has re rebounded nicely off of that March low to the upside. Had a pretty nice bounce in the accumulation distribution. When I look at the relative strength, you know, versus the rel or, uh, versus the specialty retailers, uh, AZO has broken out to about a two month high. So it's starting to look a little bit better. But overall, this one's been going down for six months. I'm just okay with AutoZone. I like the fact that it's starting to pick up a little bit, but I think it's got some overhead resistance at 1150. Uh, as long as it continues to hold that 20 day to the downside, I'm okay with it. But earnings may tell us something one way or the other on AutoZone. Keysight Technologies, K-E-Y-S. Uh, accumulation distribution just been kind of flat. Stock's been trending up mostly above the 20-day moving average, but relative to its peers, it's been downtrending for two months. This is another one that's just kind of so-so for me. I'm not overly thrilled with it, but I'm not bearish either. Anaplan, this is a software company, and it's starting to gain some strength here. I've noticed this over the past seven or eight trading days here. Big reversal off that 20-day moving average. Nice move. Look at the volume picking up as well. I think there is some accumulation taking place. And this was a stock that was underperforming software for about eight months. But the last month, month and a half, we've seen that turn around and start to come back up. Uh, I don't know. I would, uh, I'm expecting a good report here based on what I'm seeing on the chart. Uh, it's not the best, obviously. It's not one of the strongest software stocks, but it is improving. So I would be looking for a better report. Uh, Autodesk, ADSK. Uh, nice breakout here above the recent high in late April, which was just below 190. I would be looking for that 190 level and or the rising 20 day to continue to hold. Another one relative to software that's been going down for a few months, but it started to strengthen the last month and a half. That did break out above the S&P, but that's because it's part of such a strong software group. So overall, I'm just kind of okay with Autodesk. Again, I think there are better looking stocks going into earnings reports. Workday, workday, accumulation distribution flat, stock's been rebounding, but it's rebounding because the overall market is. It's still got a long way to go to get back up to that February high. And you can see relative to software, it's been on a steady decline now for a better part of the year, maybe, maybe more than a year. So I don't know. I think Workday, I would pass on. I'd look for something else. HPQ, this is uh, HP Inc. Uh, we did just make a breakout above this double top in April, but we still got that first initial reaction high near $18 to clear. I think we could get to 18 Beyond that, I'd be a little concerned. And once again, you're looking at a stock relative to its peers that just isn't performing well. I'd rather go with the ones that are outperforming on a relative basis. VIPS, this is VIP shop. This one is, I'm not really sure what to make here. Broadline retailers have been incredibly strong relative to uh, the S&P. And this stock relative to Broadline retailers was at an all, I think it was an all time high, certainly a one year high in March. But since then has been steadily declining. And the one thing that really bothers me a little bit is the volume picking up over the last week. But we did put in a little bit of a reversing candle as we got close to key support down around $14. I would like to see VIPs hold 14. And if they come out with another solid report, I think it's very possible the stock makes another run back toward 19, maybe even above it. Um, this one I'd give a little bit more of a bullish edge to. 
Uh, if it breaks down after its earnings below that 14 level, I'd be much more careful. All right, uh, network appliance, just gonna do one or two more of these. Network appliance, uh, the reaction move back to the upside here has been very, very, I don't know, very, I don't even know what the right word is. It just hasn't been very good, let me just say that. Big move down from 65 down to 35, and all we've done is get back to 45. Long way to go to get back to where we were in January. Look at the relative strength here, relative weakness. Um, I'm not a fan of network appliance. Uh, how about uh, Costco? Costco is going to be reporting later this week. Um, AD line, just okay. Stock's been consolidating. Had a big, big move up in April, but has since come back down. Holding on to support. I'd, I'd look for 295 to continue holding. And we've got uh, highs up just above 320. That's your range for now. Uh, two software stocks that actually look pretty good to me. One is Viva Systems. Big move up here. Uh, if you go down, you can see on a relative basis, we've seen a lot of relative strength in this stock now in the last three or four months. So this is a little bit better than just one month. I think the market is anticipating a big report with uh, Viva. And then the last one I wanted to show you is Okta, A -O -A, excuse me, OKTA. Uh, this one I really expect a good report. Of all the companies reporting this week, I don't know if there's a better looking one than OKTA. Look at the accumulation distribution going up. Look at all of these hollow candles, which I think is just indicative of accumulation. Beautiful move up, easily clearing these prior highs. And then look at the relative strength. OKTA relative to the software index breaking out to new highs, 52 week highs, and you're in one of the best groups. I'll be shocked if OKTA doesn't come out with a good report um, on, uh, later this week. Now, we have seen companies that are bid up into earnings have decent reports and then still go down. Watch that 20 day moving average. I think on a pullback, if it's a buy on rumor, sell on news kind of event, I think that 20 day could be a great entry into OKTA later. All right, uh, let's wrap this thing up. We're gonna get into the three you must see. And I'm gonna start this off with raw stores. So the thing I like about raw stores is number one, we've had a nice reaction off of this low, big move down, but we rallied back very nicely. And I think we're just sideways consolidating. You look at, look at this as an uptrend with a cup, or you can just simply look at this as an uptrend with sideways consolidation, break above 100, be very bullish to the downside, maybe watch 80. But I think the fact that this one topped and is starting to pull back, I even think that 20 day moving average, you might see some buyers stepping in on raw stores. So that one I thought was worth mentioning. Next up, Target, TGT. Target got up over 125 and very close to its December high back here, which was around 128. Um, overbought, uh, the PPO was getting a little stretched. You can see we failed there at about four. We got up to four and started to roll back over here. I actually think we're gonna bounce off this 20 day though. So I think uh, we've been down four days in a row now, going back throughout most of last week. I think we're gonna bounce off this 20 day moving average. We're down about seven, eight, maybe $9 from that recent high. I think we hit the 20 day. I think that's an area worthwhile uh, considering. And then finally, to wrap up, uh, ATHM. I just like this one because it's come up, it's sideways consolidating, failed at resistance 82.50, but now it's all the way back down near support at 72.50. Watch for a reversal down at that level. That's your three you must see. I wanna wish everybody a great trading day. Happy trading. Hey guys, Grayson Rose here with StockCharts.com. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Remember, if you did, give us a like down below, leave us a comment, we'd love to hear from you. And most importantly, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial minds. We'll see you back here very soon. Happy charting, my friends.